You know, I have had those classes, like, I've had them, like, most of my life. It was really only during COVID that I really decided I was, like, it was one of those weird things where I'm, like, all right, I'm going to complete this collection, you know? Yeah. Um, but I never used them to drink out of. They were just always shelf decorations until I saw, like, Sandy was doing it on the beer thread. He's actually using the glasses. I'm, like, why don't I actually drink out of these damn things, you know? Right. So. They were, like, you know, man, they were, like, um these kind of magical things. Cause you didn't ha like, nobody really had all of them as a kid, you know, like, mm -hmm. cause nobody was that entitled back then, you know? And uh, <laughs> so these things, like you would go over to a friend's house and like, they would have like one in there, you know, one or two of them in their yep. you know, itchy and you'd be like, Oh my God, I haven't seen the captain America or the, you know, or the flash or whatever the thing was. And it was just mm -hmm. super exciting to get your, you know, your, your, your Kool-Aid. Cause that's what we all drank back then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Totally. And as an adult, I would like stumble across them every now and then. Like, I think I was out on like this little island called Whidbey Island. And I found a Robin glass for $5 and I'm like, oh, nostalgia. And so I would pick them up every now and then. But I always like made this sort of like rule to myself that I would never purposely seek them out. If I just right. sort of stumbled across one, I would buy one. But then I was like, all right, the last like five rare glasses, I'm never going to stumble across. So I just like went to eBay and just bought the rest of them. For sure. In the and that's the thing. I mean, like, there's like I don't think we have the opportunity to stumble on anything anymore. Like mm -hmm. everybody knows the value of everything. Yeah. So there's no sort of like, oh, you don't know that this glass is worth fifteen dollars. Like, right. I'll buy it. yeah. And it's not like they're worth a lot of money. Like even the, even the most expensive one, it's like, oh, it's twenty dollars for this, you know, back girl. It's like, oh, it's fine. I'll pay twenty dollars. Yeah. And it, yeah, you're. I mean, you're so right in the sense that like they're like their value is purely nostalgic like, oh yeah yeah because it's not a matter of like oh my gosh this like this was a piece of artwork done only for this this was from this was from a library of artwork that they just yeah. pulled from they just yep slapped it over a moon and okay let's let's get that in product you know in production so yeah and i'm much happier now that i actually use them it just adds a lot more fun to them and i'm like well if i break one you know i mean who really cares you know right. yeah i mean it's not the end of the world <laughs> Although, because my favorite is Shazam, I do have, I think, three different Shazam glasses, because that's the one where exactly. if ever I, yeah, if ever I see one, I'll buy a couple of extras, because I did, and then I did break one in a move, so I was so glad that I had the extra backup. That isn't that kind of strange, like, we, well, like, as, as, like, a collecting point of view, like, there is a sort of, like, there is always kind of an item that we will always kind of get mm -hmm. multiple copies of whatever that thing is, yep. not that we need it, it's just this, like, sort of, like, I love it so much. I've, I got to have a bunch of them just in mm -hmm. case. Yeah. Yep. And you see one, you're like, well, I can't not buy it if it's right there. You know, right. I mean, come on. There's like a specific comic yeah. that I love. And I think it's just one of the greatest comics ever. And like, I'm like, if I ever see it, I buy it. Like, I just, okay, I don't Okay. Well, care. now you got to tell me which one it is. It's, uh, it's Marvel Fanfare number 48, I believe. So mm -hmm. it was the, the lost Michael Golden Spider. Spider-Man, Bill Mantlo and uh, Michael Golden did this uh, Spider-Man Hulk uh, single issue, which oh, wow. was like started on issue three of Marvel Fanfare. So like mm -hmm. Michael did the first two issues and then started number three and then something happened. Mm -hmm. And I've forgotten what the lore is about that, but something happened and it just sat in the flat files. Well, in Marvel... Marvel Fanfare, I thought, because I used to get Marvel Fanfare all the time. I loved it. I thought it was the inventory stories. No, they, no. Um, fanfare started off as like this, like big sort of like opportunity for them to like make a legitimate, like upper scale, like because it was oh, minor, yeah. it was on a nicer paper. Uh -huh. So like yep. they, it was a, it was a premium product for them. So that's why they had like, because like the, the first two issues were Spider Man go and the Angel going to Savage Lands. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, like, sort of carried on the story idea further. Huh. Like, Paul Smith did the artwork for that. So, like, you know, phenomenal. Yeah. And it just kept kind of going that way. And then I think when they were just kind of wrapping it up, they were like, we got to print all the stuff that we got. And they're like, what about <laughs> this? You know? And they and they put it out. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah. I would only get that one periodically. Like, Marvel fans, I was one of those ones where it had, like, a creator or a character I wanted that I would buy it, right. but just for that. Like, they had the really great John Byrne Silent Hulk issue in there yep. that was fantastic. And um, I think they did Weird, Weird World for a while also, and I picked up a few of those ones. And... and I think that was probably its 
greatest weakness was mm-hmm. that people weren't buying it because of the creators or the the premium quality you know predominantly mm-hmm. they were like oh i love the hulk i'm gonna buy yeah. it. And, and and unfortunately like you can't sustain a book on like that 10 percent of the market kind of mm-hmm. being whatever you're putting out there mm-hmm. well, no that's true and it had had a heftier price tag as i recall too oh, which yeah, was, yeah you know, sure i mean if like if comics were like 60 mm-hmm. cents that thing yeah. was a buck 40 you know yeah which is weird because at the same time i bought epic illustrated which is one of my favorite things of all time and it was more expensive and had no characters i liked but somehow it was magazine format and it carried all this cachet that that fanfare didn't so oh for sure like i yeah i don't i'm not sure who was behind Mm. that particular one in the editorial office i know that larry hama was big on the magazine size size Mm -hmm. stuff in the 70s and the eight in the 80s so yeah I, i attribute a lot of like those books that we had we all look back like fondly you know to larry's sort of like at least dogged determination to have that magazine form and i don't know whether it was his direction or that was a stan thing because yeah i mean i think of it as a roy thomas thing but i think that's only because of roy thomas doing savage sort of conan which led into which really was my gateway into the um, magazine stuff because i was buying savage sort of conan being a huge Conan fan, but then on the rack behind it would be Epic Illustrated. I'd be like, yeah. oh, what's this? You know? Yeah. And they like, um, they, you, know, you get the, and then, then like there would just be the random things like, what is it? Savage Tales. Savage or, Tales. Well, Savage Tales preceded Savage Sort of Conan. And then it, when it folded, that became Savage yeah. Sort of Conan. Yeah. yeah. They kept the Savage moniker. Yeah. You know what? It's going to stay in the catalog right in the same, same right. Slot. And I think that was like a Stan Lee thing because he loved those like savage, astonishing, you know, oh, yeah, he just yeah. loved the yeah. the adjectives that were just, you know, like, well, we we got to fix something that sells with savage because it's a great word. And I think I mean, I think the other thing was, I mean, I think the initial directive, all that stuff came from Stan because he like he was. um I think he was always trying to build the market like where mm-hmm. their product could land. And if it wasn't in the comic rack, but it was in a magazine rack, there might mm-hmm. be an opportunity for, you know, getting more, you know, readers. Yeah. So like, that's why, like, what was it? Pizzazz? Like I had a subscription. Oh, Pizzazz. Pizzazz. Yeah. Pizzazz. And I remember getting, yeah. letter, I got a letter from them, you know, from Marvel and saying like, we're sorry to say that, you know, Pizzazz is going away because I had a subscription. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, so if you would like to roll over your subscription into the, and it was so much more expensive, the subscription mm-hmm. to Pizzazz and the regular book. Like I got three comic book subscriptions that they gave me the whole year. They didn't just say like, they didn't prorate it. They were just like, just pick three books oh, so, wow. like, for a whole year. Like I got the Avengers, the X-Men and something else. Huh. And, yeah. Was yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I never, I never had a subscription to anything because I never had that much money all at once. I was, was totally like, a, it yeah. was four dollars. Right. Like it's so ridiculous. Like I a know. whole year, like that whole year of Frank Miller, like doing yep. Daredevil, cost me four dollars, and they're uh-huh. worth like seven hundred dollars. You know? It's, yeah, yeah. It's nuts. Um, Zach Davison has joined me, and Zach, thank you. I'm really, really happy to have you here. Um, you were a, uh, I guess a a Twitter Twitter find for me, like you know, ever when people have like interest, they say interesting things and put interesting things up. I'm always like, oh, who is this person? I start like doing the like the the, the you know the paying attention thing, and then I'm like, oh, like this is a pretty cool cat, and I'm super fascinated by like, you know, your your background profile. I'm like, okay, I really want to talk to Zach. So, um, and you have a beautiful background of uh, oh. Really, wow. really well, uh, well curated wall there. So um. yes, yes, this is uh, what's what's known in the industry as I've heard called the credibility bookcase. Sweet. You know, because when you do backdrops, I mean, it's not really this is just how it happened to me, but someone pointed out to me, it's like, oh, when you do these sort of podcasts, you show up and you have this bookcase in the back, and oh, now you look smart and intelligent. I'm like, well, awesome for that. It's really just Great. all my junk, but yeah. <laughs> Well, junk and treasure, two different mm-hmm. things, right? right. Um, or the same thing. So, um, but, yeah, so I mean, listen, let's talk translation yep. first and foremost. Like that is, so you, you have, you are a translator and that's pretty interesting considering the contextual, you know, mm-hmm. sort of uh, hurdles that that entails. And in the fact that you're applying it into the comic world, like, how did that like how did that happen like for you so 
translation is really like, you know, it, it, I never really set out to be a translator. And it's interesting to think of myself as a translator because I, I don't really think of myself as a translator per se. Like I know yeah. there's people who are translators and like that is what they do. Um, and I am a translator as part of my sort of suite of offerings, I guess. Um, it really started just because, gosh, I mean, to give you the whole sort of like background story, my origin story, you know, I was, um, I was like mid thirties and I was a project manager at Amazon. And I was like, I had like a good career and I had good stock options and I had, you know, like this solid future ahead of me. And I was just sitting at my desk one day at Amazon and I was just like, I was just like literally just looking around, like, is this all I get? Like, is this all oh. I get out of life? Like I have all this stuff that by most people's idea is a good solid life career future you know all this mm -hmm. other stuff um good path everything was set and i'm like but i i loved nothing of it i was not passionate about a single thing i was doing i i hated it i hated going to work you know project managing projects i didn't care if they were successful like i just didn't care about any of it and i was just like you know what all my life like i've had i've had dreams and i have done none of them and one of my dreams like i've always been interested in going to Japan. Like I tried to study Japanese when I was in junior high school um, and in high school, but at the time there wasn't really enough interest in Japanese. And so all the classes kept getting canceled and I really didn't learn anything, but I was just like, I looked up some programs, like how you could actually go live in Japan. And I found this one called the JET program. And they were like, oh, we'll give you a visa to go live in Japan for a year. And I was like, I'm doing it. So I quit my job at Amazon. I threw away this promising future i um uh, probably my biggest mistake was i also at the same time sold all of my stocks which i probably Ooh, shouldn't have yeah, done sure. yeah, i sold all sold all my amazon stocks for a whopping ten thousand dollars uh yeah, they, yeah they're worth a little bit more now but whatever that's life you know easy come easy go so yeah then i jumped on this plane to japan and i thought well i'm gonna go over here for like a year and i'll have this experience and then i'll come back and I'll just reset, you know, go back to the life that I was, the path that I was on before. Um, but I didn't. I mean, I stayed in Japan for about seven to eight years, uh, you know, on like five of that on the JET program. And then after the JET program, you know, stayed on for additional years. I ended up getting my master's degree over in Japan um, in Hiroshima. And I also just like, I fell in love with this artist called Mizuki Shigeru. And he was just like, he was this weird moment in my life because you know, I, I've always been a comic guy. And like, we were talking a little bit earlier about that before the official start, but like comics have been a part of my life for forever, for as long as I've been cognizant. Yeah. I've never experienced life without comics. Right. And I always liked Japanese comics. And I always thought of myself, you know, even going over to, before going to Japan, I was like, oh, I was the Japan guy, you know, like I watched the Ghibli films before sure. I knew they were, you know, I read the manga, I did all this stuff. And then you go to Japan and I realized that, the Japan that I knew, the Japan that we all watch in the U.S. is a very curated experience. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do whatsoever with the real Japan. It is a m Japan that is carefully curated as marketable to Western audiences. So they look at the stuff in Japan and they're like, Americans will buy this. And so that's the Japan we get. We get the, yeah, right? We get the Japan that West, that certain publishing companies are, you know, have decided is sellable to Westerners. Sure, yeah. You know? And then you get to actual Japan and you're like, well, this is all, I know nothing of this. You know, one of these artists was Mizuki Shigeru and he was just everywhere. I mean, he was clearly one of the most important, not only artists in Japan, but clearly one of the most important people in Japan. I mean, he was still alive when I got there, um, you know, and he was just everywhere. And I was like, wow, how is it possible that me as this person is like, oh, I've had this vested interest in Japan and blah, 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 blah. And I get there. And one of the single most important people in the entire culture is someone I've never heard of. And that was just shocking to me, you know? Um, I, you know, I try to tell people this, like, imagine if you had this Japanese person come over and you met this Japanese person and they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in American culture. I have been super interested in American animation in particular. Like, I just love American animation. It is my, it is my passion, it is my heart, it is all I have studied. And you're like, Oh, really? So are you a Disney fan? And they're like, who the fuck is Walt Disney? Like, that, that's about how it came out to me. Yeah. It's like this most single, most monumental, influential figure. And I had never even heard of them. And it just really represented to me um, how ignorant I was of everything and how what I thought was knowledge, what I thought I knew was, in fact, 
complete and utter ignorance. Um, right. And I, I just became obsessed with Mizuki Shigeru and his work was available nowhere in English. And I was like, you know what? If I'm going to read this, I'm going to have to learn Japanese because there's no other way. And so he was really my carrot, you know, that just drove me into studying Japanese as hard as I could because I wanted to unlock his work. I wanted to understand yeah. this this person, you know. Um, and the more I read of his work, the more I fell in love with it. And the more I just like became, you know, like I became this evangelist to where the point I decided I was going to make it my holy mission in life to bring Mizuki Shigeru to English. Like I had a I had a friend who had a bar in Osaka and one night I literally got really drunk and stood up on a table and I went, I shall be the one to bring Mizuki Shigeru to the West. And like my friends in Japan just thought I was a lunatic, but they all knew that I was just obsessed and, you know. Um, and then I got here and, you know, I just started doing you know when i eventually came back to the united states i just started like doing the work i started doing all these translations of his work and sitting about to companies and getting rejections and rejections and rejections and just really trying to shop around the idea of uh of doing music and she gave translations um and then finally i hooked up with john and quarterly you know and then, then it, it worked out you know and i got to do it and and from there i started you know <clears throat> doing other stuff. I was like, okay, well, so I'm doing music. So then I started like, you know, sort of like looking at other artists I was passionate about, like Matsumoto Leiji. I was really passionate about, you know, going to guy and doing some translations for them. Uh, and then along the way, I did some other translations that I, of people I wasn't super excited about. And, you know, it was like just paycheck translations. And that kind of taught me that I have no interest in doing that. I have no interest in just cashing checks and translating comics that I'm not super excited about. And I'm like, all right, so that's not going to be my career. I'm not, and I realized that about myself, like, you know, and so then I'm like, well, I also like to write. And I, so I started, you know, I would write my own books and I wrote this website and then that has transitioned to, you know, just a much larger career um, of being what I'd really wanted to be at the start was, you know, to be like a writer, translator, mm -hmm. rather than just a translator, you know, right. or just a writer. I like doing both of them. So anyways, that's the big long origin story. So what, of what years were the seven years you were in Japan? So I was there from 2001 to 2008. Okay, wow, all right. That's an interesting, that's interesting. Yeah, so, um, yeah I, missed, I missed out entirely on 9-11 uh, and all of that yeah. stuff. So, you know, yeah, which was really strange to watch from overseas. I would assume so. I mean, I, re mm -hmm. I remember traveling not too long after that and being, you know, in the highlands of scotland and it, my wife and i were being sort of grilled by random people you know you know about the u.s in regards to 9-11 and because yeah. they, they were just curious about you know what was happening what was happening from a distance mm -hmm. um so what like what sort of like pre going to japan like what sort of you know manga was capturing your eye uh, I really read a lot of Joji Matabe stuff, like from Dark Horse. That was probably one of my first yeah. ones. I actually have a Joji Matabe tattoo. That was my first tattoo. Um, his stuff's really fallen out of favor, but it was at the time it was really quite popular. It was like stuff like Outlanders and Caravan Kid and Dracoon was really a big mm -hmm. hit. Um, it's interesting how see you know how he really hasn't passed the test of time per se, even though I like his work immensely and still do like it. Um, I, then I started getting into more stuff like. Um, Gosh, who was it? Eclipse was putting out. Well, and actually, this was a little earlier, but Eclipse put out like My the Psychic Girl. Oh my and gosh, they put yeah. out, yeah, they put out some titles like like Gray and just like like all these comics, and they were just really fascinating to me. And it was also, I would say, a time that was just perfect for me because American comics had started going down a path that I was no longer interested in, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, the Western superhero market. I mean, the stuff that I'd grown up with, the stuff that I'd been super passionate about, and this was in the '90s where they started going out towards, you know the more Rob Liefeld stuff and like yeah. the Jim Lee stuff and the sort of like, I don't want to say overdone art style because I know there's some people who really appreciate that art style. I'm just not one of them, but they started moving towards this sort of like more less story driven and more sort of like spectacle driven style yeah. of storytelling. And I just, they just lost me. And manga was there with the story and character driven story storytelling that I really love, you know, like, like when we talk about stuff like Western comics, you know, people will always talk about, you know, what, what really drove you in? You know, what did you like? You know, was it this person? Was it this badass person? It was like, no, honestly, it was the Kitty Pride and um, Peter Rasputin romance. Sure. That was that was what 
got me into comics you know yeah yeah um, no it's, it's wow you're so you're, you're just kind of so right about that because it was it was kitty pride um it was it, it was the you know it was the teen titans how like mm -hmm. that, that interpersonal issues that they ha that they had woven into those characters yep um yeah that was super that was super important and it was easier to kind of connect to that than it was whatever problems steve rogers was having or you yeah. know because they were they were they were grown-ups you know yep. when you're young you're kind of like oh i can identify with that kind of feeling out of out of the loop or something mm -hmm. yeah but i mean exactly that like teen titans was another one i got super involved with you know because and it was all the it was all the teenage crushes i mean that's what i liked about the books sure. you know all those sort of like but done in a done in a way that was good storytelling you know that wasn't yeah. pandering or ridiculous because as a 13 year old or a 12 year old the last thing on earth i want to read is a comic that feels like it was written for a 13 year old or a 12 year old you know i want to read stuff that i think i'm not supposed to be reading because it's yeah. secret you know um it's a, it's, yeah. it's, a slippery, it's a slippery slope you know when people who are you know sort of creating things and the the people go like, well it's got a kid in this so kids will like it and it's like that's not always the case like no, yeah the, the kids don't want to look at the kid and say like that's me in the story they want to look and no. say like I'm Captain America, and it's just how do you yeah. that, how do you get them into that into that? Totally, story? totally. It's not yeah, exactly. You don't want to say that's me. You want to look at it and say that's who I will become. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The the, yeah. Yeah, the ideal. Well, mm -hmm. like when it came to like so like for me like manga didn't happen until the late I guess the later '80s for me. Like you know, I mean, I remember seeing mm -hmm. my um, I remember seeing the early Akira stuff showing up. You know, mm -hmm. in the shops. But like before, for me, it was it was seeing the the the, the Japanese cartoons on television. So like you know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say it, Battle of the Planets. You know, oh yeah, you know yep. that was like the, that for me was the big one. There was a bunch mm -hmm. of earlier ones that I remember I would see when I would go visit family in the Detroit area because that mm -hmm. I, I didn't get like we didn't get like the New York stations for cartoons on the weekends or whatever it was. But like you go to Detroit and they're playing like all these. You know, I would see, I would get to watch Ultraman and all these kind of cool things that I'd never, you know, mm -hmm. wow, have this. And there was this, it's interesting how that otherness of the Japanese aesthetic and storytelling and performance and production value is exciting in relation to what we sort of see as the sort of the, the Hanna-Barbera, mm -hmm. you know, animation. Oh. I mean, Alex Toth is a genius. Mm -hmm. But every cartoon done by Alex Toth isn't, you know, they all look like great Alex Toth cartoons. Mm -hmm. Well, and I felt, I mean, I fell in love with those as well. Like even, you know, far before manga and everything, like Star Blazers was immensely oh, influential yeah, on me. Um, yeah. But the character design and things like that, they were much less a part of it than the fact that, that Star Blazer told complete stories in a way that American cartoons never did. You know, I mean, you know, Scooby-Doo was Scooby-Doo and I loved it. It was super fun. But nothing ever happened, you know. It was just yeah. an episode happened, and then it was done, you know. Where stuff yeah. like Star Blazers that was so fascinating was, you know, characters died, characters literally died, and then they never appeared again, and that was such a shocker to see. Because like you'd have something like, like GI Joe. As always, I had this comparison because I, um, you know, my one of my neighbors loved GI Joe, and I'm like, look, GI Joe, an airplane gets shot out of the air by missiles. And it crashes on the ground, and the pilot inevitably walks away, rubbing the back of his neck. It was just such a ridiculous joke. You'd like, oh, yeah. that sure hurt to get hit by a missile and crash. And I mean, this like <laughs> Star Blazers, you know, someone gets shot down, they're dead. That is it. They, you know, and that was another one of those things where it felt like it was above what my level. Like stuff like yeah. American cartoons, like GI Joe, it felt like it was being designed for me, you know, because it was like, oh, kids can't handle death kids can't handle relationships kids can't handle really consequences for actions is what it is as american cartoons had no consequences for actions whatsoever um whereas the even stuff like battle of the planets you know there were actual consequences and effects for actions and there was complete storytelling and there was complete characters and that's what really hooked me into it um and the, once again the same thing with manga when it when it first started appearing, I did that sort of transition was this idea that you had personal relationships and you had emotion and you had, you know, um, all of this stuff that was what I crave in storytelling and still crave to this day.
Yeah, it's you know, I, I it's funny because like when you said Star Blazers, what I what I felt was how those stories built on each other. Like mm-hmm. like something was happening, and and what what I thought of was like, I think when I first became aware of like in television, you know, the mm-hmm. idea of a story actually like building on itself for a series, not for like a you know, not mm-hmm. like a mini series, but like it was watching Magnum PI oh. and when his buddy gets killed, gets blown up in the Ferrari in the parking lot. Yeah. And the Russian agent was the guy who did it. And at the end of whatever that double episode thing was, Magnum's got the guy cornered, Ivan, and it's like, hey, you know, and the guy, and then he turns around, he goes, because they were going to go off and look at the sunset. And then he turns mm-hmm. around, and he goes, hey, Ivan, did you see the sunset this morning? And he goes, oh, yes, it was quite beautiful. And Magnum shoots the guy and kills him. Yeah. And like, for me, I'm like, oh my God. Like it's, mm-hmm. because it wasn't, okay, reset and start over next week. It was, this changes this character permanently. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that like, so that like, it's seeing that kind of stuff was super important. And I think Star Blazers felt like things were actually like changing. They weren't, mm-hmm. it wasn't just like, and we're back and start over again and do another story. You know? Yep. There was there was heartbreak, there was death, there was you know once again there was consequences. I loved Magnum PI by the way, excellent example as another thing that was just like foundational storytelling wise because of that very reason because things happened and there were consequences and things mattered. Um, well, I think which but, like Belisario like as a as a producer like had the show and he had a success and the success mm-hmm. was you know cool guy, cool location, cool car. You know, it's like the Rockford Files, but on an island, you know, mm-hmm. and we'll just solve mysteries every week. But then, like, I think he was like, you know what? We I can do more with this. Like, I can actually tell, like, stories within the stories. Mm-hmm. And the, like, Higgins' story became just stopped being a trope and became something of a character through the mm-hmm. whole series. And I oh, think yeah. it's super important. And, like, and for me, as, like, a story, as a, as a writer, like, I think that stuff impacted me in my storytelling, you know, the way mm-hmm. I think about things. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, and same, you know, um, and I think of like, like stuff like Magnum SPI, I, I made the comparison with the TV show Schitt's Creek. If you've ever, have you seen that oh, at yeah, all? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So Schitt's Creek, like the first season is pretty boring. It's like one little joke and they have their joke and you know, it's like, oh, the rich people in the small town, you know, blah, blah, blah. But once that season's over, they're like, oh, we got to do another season. And someone there's like, well, why don't we make it good? You know, why don't we do something with these characters? And so it just suddenly transforms into this phenomenally emotional season that you get really invested in, in a way that I never was when it was just the jokes, you know, right. um, yeah. same with Magnum PI. Like when, if it's just about the, the cool car and the cool shirt, then I'm never going to get invested in it. And you know, that's another way that I feel like 90s comics like lost me because it became about the cool car and the cool shirt. It became about the visual stylings and and very shallow and nothing, then no depth. You know, it became about just character design, you know, um, and that that bores me. I mean, that's like people like I and I know some people really like it, like people will really get into the Transformers and I'm just like why like there's nothing there they were they were literally just toy commercials and i never really got that excited about the toys to be honest you know yeah. um and it's i mean the you know those things could also come like in, in like mm-hmm. gi joe and transformers i was just a bit too old for, you know at the time yep. so when they hit I, I was like it's just not really like like when we would watch cartoons like after mm-hmm. in high school we would go hey let's just hang out and watch cartoons or whatever it was you know like it, you know, they would come on and it would be like He Man, and we're like, and like we were just like, it's just too young for us, like mm-hmm. to be interested in it. I get people who are love it, and that's mm-hmm. cool. You know, it's yeah. just, it, it didn't have any sort of like weight to it or interest. So, until of course you got to the comics, because then you have someone like Larry Hama, which you know right. when I'm talking about GI Joe, I'm talking yeah. about the cartoon, obviously, because then Larry Hama took the comic and he gave it weight. You know, he yeah. gave it so much more depth than I ever thought would have been possible. So, I mean, a lot of this stuff, it just takes a good creator to really get in there and find the, um, the heart of it and tell those stories. Yeah. And I, it, it, and that's, a, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you know, there is like, there, like I said, there's no bad characters. It's just, you just need like, it, it's, there's just mm-hmm. bad, there's bad ed- editorial decisions or bad writers, you know, and 
we, if you can clear those two things out of the way, it doesn't matter. Like someone's got a great idea for everything. Like mm -hmm. every single thing you can make yep. something cool and interesting. So, yep. um, I mean, there's characters I absolutely can't stand, but sure. I'm also fully aware of the fact that a good writer could make me, or a good, you know, creative team could suddenly make me love that character more than anything else. Like I hate Venom and Carnage. I just, right. they, they represent all the overly schlock stuff, the nineties. I can't stand it, you know, but I'm sure that there's somewhere out there, a story that would make me go like, Oh my God, Venom and Carnage are just the absolute best, you know? Totally. Totally. Or yeah. there is one that's going to happen. That'll make you feel that way. You know, mm -hmm. like it's, it's a, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, like once again, it's just, I think it's a timing thing. You know, if we mm -hmm. were probably, 14 years old when that hit we would have been like this is the coolest thing ever right totally and i and i respect the fact that for other people out there venom and carnage are literally their formative characters like yeah. they love those characters more than anyone else and i'm like i think that's great people get to have whatever it is that they love and sure. and i think that's that's wonderful and fantastic yeah because the thing that i'm i love probably is of no interest to them and that's mm -hmm. totally cool you know like yep. Which means like there's always, and it means there's always something we can discover. I mean, because maybe one day I think it's cool. Who knows? I don't mm -hmm. think it could happen, but it could happen, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I mean, so I think for me, yeah, like anime was definitely the like and TV version of anime for America was my gateway towards that stuff. And, you know, when it came to the Japanese product, mm -hmm. um, I remember, really, you know, I remember that whole push in film and I guess a little bit of television, like when, the ninja became the thing in the 80s and it was funny because i had owned i already owned a bunch of like uh there were these cool like illustrated books on like weapons of the samurai uh-huh oh yeah i had was, that book yeah, yeah line art black mm -hmm. and white thing with like with those uh you know japanese print frame on the cover yeah but they had a whole section of ninja stuff in there mm -hmm. you know and these things were produced in the 70s and they oh were, yeah they were like this font of like, this is super cool. And then Frank Miller started doing all the ninja stuff in Daredevil. So it was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was, you know, I mean, that was, I, I never know exactly who that came from. And that's, in the, you know, that's the part. Was it, was it Miller? Was it Claremont? You know, like mm -hmm. who started bringing in that sort of Japanese um, element to it? Because I, you know, that was another thing. Cause I had similar books. I had, I had probably the exact same book. And that's another one of those things where I thought I knew so much stuff and I would tell people, I'd be like, oh, this is a sigh and it is this. And, this. and then you want to go to Japan and find out that that is all just BS, like just right. complete and utter BS. Um, but I was so convinced of my own knowledge of that. Uh, and I actually, I went out to dinner with Chris Claremont one time and I was, I got to tell him that I was like, you know, honestly, like, this is kind of your fault because I started reading this stuff in the X-Men and like, you know, Wolverine is going to Japan and like, yeah. it just excited me so much that that was a large part of the seeds that got me really into, and Frank Miller as well. When I met Frank Miller, I told him, I was like, you know, like I am the, you know, I'm the flower you planted that seed of so long ago and you didn't even know it. You're just like, you know, I think I'll put this cool little, thing in here i'll put these ninjas in here and then there's me reading that and i'm like oh my god i'm gonna go to japan and i'm gonna learn all this stuff and then i come back and uh yeah they're largely to blame for my current existence yeah and i can i can i can yeah i i can see how that happens mm -hmm. i know i know many of the tracks i've run down were mm -hmm. from those seeds planted by people who super you know influential in my life yep and I had no idea they were doing it. They were just like, oh, I think I'll, yeah, no one else is doing this. This is cool. I think I'll write about it real quick. Oh, and then boom. Sure. And, you know, so much of it is like, hey, this is just an ends to a mean. I need to get, mm -hmm. I need ideas for the story. This is kind of cool. Fine. I'll, 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 go, I'll run down this rabbit. It's pretty interesting. Let's have some fun with this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, oh, I've got a better idea that I'm going to hit start doing next, you know, it, it, you know, next year. And that, you mm -hmm. know, then it's just as an as a writer you you write what you're interested in and then you move on to something else mm -hmm. uh, yeah exactly and, and then the shrapnel is our lives <laughs> is our lives exactly uh that is a great way of putting it you know and i was just reading um a interesting neil gaiman book about uh called trigger warning and he was kind of talking about that about how um yeah. You know, writers, basically what we are is we are just basically libraries of all the people's work that we've read. And yeah. then we, you know, it, it we make something new out of it, you know, but um, all of us are 
pulling into our own person. You know, we pull a page here, a leaf here, a word there, a phrase there, you know, and that's how it should be. You know, like he's like, yeah, I mean, half the time in this book, he's like, half the time when I sit down to write, I channel Ray Bradbury, you know, and then right. there's other artists who then will channel Gaiman channeling Brad Bradbury that then becomes something brand new, you know, yeah. Um, and yeah. I like that idea of shrapnel. That is pretty. That is pretty accurate. I have all these pieces of shrapnel from all these like things that are really impactful, really important in my life, and then I merge that into together into something new. Yeah, it's like it's like you know, it's like that little piece of lead here that got stuck in my hand uh-huh. in fifth grade. You know, like yep. and my body is slowly incorporating this you know, <laughs> into me. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. Actually, a great book. Right here, this. Yeah. Have you read Shabon's reading and writing book? No, I haven't. Totally read it. It's okay. it's, a real, it's a real quick read. Uh, it's a maps and legends reading and writing along the borderlines. It's his book on writing. Okay. But it's sort of how his process, and it's so interesting how you were talking about what Neil was saying about you know channeling Bradbury. Mm-hmm. You definitely should read that because oh it, nice. It'll, it'll, it'll it's a good it's a good pairing with uh, trigger warnings, which is right up on that shelf. Oh yeah. nice, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's super interesting. You said that. Um, so, but let's let's talk about stories um, and writing. So, how like, I mean, you said you kind of envision yourself as a writer. You know, that was your your, your mm-hmm. sort of your self self picture. And well, like, when did that come yeah. into your head? So it came into my head, and like, this is one of the. I think like a lot of people in that end up being writers. And I, I know this from just talking to me, like I wanted to be an artist. Like that's what I really wanted to be. Oh, okay. Um, I went to art school. My bachelor's degree is a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts, you know. So I went to art school. And the main thing that I learned about in art school is that I don't have what it takes to be an artist. Like no, oh, okay. You just see people that are just, you know, like you would I would just see people who are just incredible, right? And there's people who have like you know, this talent and, you know, some people say you're not born, you're not born with any talent, which I frankly think is kind of bullshit. I think you're born with talent and then you have the drive and ambition and training to make, to make something out of that talent and you just push and push and push and that's how great artists happen. Um, I just felt like I never had that talent. Like as much as I pushed and pushed and pushed, there were always people that are going to be better than me because they had this combination of things. Um, that I didn't have. They had the the storm. And I was like, you know what? There's really no room for mediocre in Mm -hmm. something like the comics world. You know, there's just no room. Like I was, I could get myself up to pretty good, but no one hires pretty good. You know, they don't, they don't hire pretty good. And I was like, okay, so if I'm not going to be a comic artist or an artist at all, then what, what will I do? You know? And I was like, what I'm really good at is writing and storytelling. You know, I mean, that was where clearly I was better at and it was just sort of like the Joseph Campbell follow your bliss thing, you know, instead of trying to keep fighting against what I was naturally inclined to do in order to do this other thing, just because it seemed more glamorous, you know, I mean, yeah. the artist was always just more glamorous than the writer in every single way in comics. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I followed artists more than I followed writers and I did have writers I liked, but, you know, you certainly you know, like when I talk about the X-Men, I generally talk about Paul Smith's X-Men because sure. that's who I love, you know, yeah. um, even though it was Claremont as well. But, you know, and, I, and then I just started writing and getting more into writing and finding out that I was that I was good at it, you know, that it's something that I'm more naturally inclined to do. And there was a few, I guess, what I would consider to be sort of like my heroes, you know, like it, as it is with Neil Gaiman and Ray Bradbury, there's this guy called Lefkadio Hearn who wrote in Japan and he was... um he did, he did basically kind of modeled my career, I guess, that he did translation, he did nonfiction works, he did fiction works. I mean, he just basically wrote what he feel like, felt like writing mm-hmm. instead of um, needing to decide that he was one or the other, you know, just like he opened up and what, let whatever came out or whatever came out or whatever he could sell or whatever it was, you know, um, and I really liked that style. So I like the idea of doing, you know, sort of like, and I love folklore and I love these, you know, all these sort of like hidden secret parts of the world. And so I'm mm-hmm. like, well, I can do fiction books about this that are sort of interesting fiction books. And I can do nonfiction works as well. And I can also work in comics and I can also, you know, do this sort of like smattering of all sorts of things. And I also do a lot of um, lecturing. I was just down in New Mexico lecturing at a, uh, at a, 
museum. So um, yeah, no, I I think I read you mm, you posted about that. You were down. Yeah, there. yeah. So that's like another part of the sort of things I do. So I don't really like I'm in a way I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, master yeah. of none in that area, and that I don't think I'm the absolute best at any of those, but I do them all. And maybe that was my niche of like, there's no room for good enough. And maybe if you're good enough at a whole bunch of things, then that's yeah. enough of a, you know, Listen, man, we all flavor. need a Swiss Army knife. You know? Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's going to get you through um, most of the problems. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I think I am a, I think I am a good translator. I think I'm a, you know, I think I'm a good writer. I think I'm good at all, good enough, obviously, at all of those things I do. I would never say that I'm the best of the world at any of them, because there's certainly people that are better at all of them than I am. But I've managed to sort of like create a create a niche, you know, for myself. Yeah. That, um, I fortunately people have found value at. Right. <laughs> That's you know? it. Yeah. What, what was it like? I mean, you said you said that like you like you know you were looking at your 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 peer group mm -hmm. when you're in school and realizing maybe I'm not sort of capable of producing at the mm -hmm. level that they're at, and I know that the level needed for the next step is even higher. Mm -hmm. So like there take there takes there takes a lot a fair amount of self awareness you know to be able to stop and take you know and mm -hmm. take that in, but what was it that gave you the sensibility that you know writing and storytelling was something you had greater fluency in? I think the fact that like when I would see my friends draw whose art was really imagine who was really amazing it's just sort of. I would I don't want to say effortless because obviously there's a lot of effort put into making you know to doing art but they could certainly just they just did it more uh, just more naturally you know yeah. um and I realized that I could do that with writing like I you know cause it's one of those things where if you have this ability to do something you don't necessarily understand that other people don't have the ability to do something totally. you know yeah. Um, because it seems so effortless and natural to you, uh, you don't really understand that that's a strength. And I never really thought of that as being one of my strengths because it was just something that was just so natural. You know, I could just do it. I could just, ever yeah. since I was in uh, school, you know, and we would have a writing assignment, like I remember my teachers would, I had one teacher and this was in high school and she was just like, she was just amazed because we had, we had to write a paper, you know? And she's like, all the other students are pre-planning and everything. She's like, Zach, I just watched you. And you literally just sat down at the word processor without any pre-planning. And you just wrote the paper. You clicked it open from the blank page. You started and you just sat there and wrote for the entire hour. And mm -hmm. then at the end, you printed the paper out. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, that's not normal i mean not normal right. but she's like she's like that is something you have that no one else that i have seen in my career has and i was like but I, because it was just the way i approach things i don't i don't understand that that it's hard for other people you know yeah um and but i did eventually learn that that was something that other people didn't necessarily have the ability to do and it was something that i did have the ability to do um and enjoyed doing and i'm good at so yeah it's you know it's what reson what's interesting and resonates with me is you know one of my sort of greatest uh, you know laments is that like my so when I first started working at Marvel um, in ninety one mm -hmm. um, you know like I I too like hey I want to be a penciler penciler mm -hmm. penciler penciler that's the magic man yep. you know? and I that's get the I, sexy job right that's the lead singer of the band man if you want to I had yeah. the long I had long blonde hair of course mm -hmm. I was a lead singer you yep. know. And I get the so I get hired for my first gig, but the project wasn't going to be coming up for months, so there was no script, so I had nothing, mm -hmm. I had no work. It was just me with this promise of a job, mm -hmm. and I wanted to work. I wanted to do something. I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to pencil. So mm -hmm. I, nobody would hire me because I hadn't proven myself because mm -hmm. the job hadn't started. So I went around. Finally, went to an editor's office, and I said, in, uh, she had an anthology, and I said, hey, if I wrote a story for you, like you know, would you buy it? And she's like, well, it has to be a good story. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. cool. But if it's a good story and you buy it, can I draw it? And she was mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, but it has to be a good story. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. cool. So I ran off, wrote the story, came back and she's like, great. I love this. You got, you know, 
steal, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, cool, I get to draw a story. Like that was all my mind. Like I was so fixated, like you were saying, mm -hmm. on the idea of being a penciler that writing the story was just an end to the mean. Like if I needed to draw something, well, I, I, shoot, making up a story is easy. You know, yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the drawing that's the hard part, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I didn't sort of look at that myself on an external level and say like, hey, dummy, you know, you could do that again. <laughs> I was just, you know, it was, I was just waiting mm -hmm. for other people to say, hey, we want you to draw this for us. You yep. know, it's like, just pave your own way. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I know like, like Kurt Busiek, he also started out wanting to be a, an artist, you know, a penciler in comics, yeah. um, you know, Jeff Parker, honestly, a lot of my favorite, a lot of my favorite writers all originally envisioned themselves as artists. And maybe that's a strength that people bring is you can actually bring that, you know, that sort of visual style of storytelling, sure. yeah. even if you don't have the chops to pull it up. Although some people, once again, have the chops to pull it off immensely, you know, like probably one of my, my favorite comic creators of all time, Mike Mignola is, um, you know, to bring him up. Yeah. yeah. Absolute <laughs> towering Titan of both. And also, you know, did not think of himself as a writer. I think no. it's amazing. Yeah. He the first himself as a comic book, he was, yeah. a, he was, a, he was an inker who, who thought like, nobody's ever going to want to hire me to draw something for, mm -hmm. for Marvel because I draw weird. Yeah. Yep. And his first Hellboy, he brought in John Byrne as training sure. wheels because he didn't feel talented this enough to write that. a book. I, re yeah. I, I mean, I remember that whole thing coming out and because they did that, they did that short little preview in Dark Horse Presents, like that six mm -hmm. page or eight page thing of yep. Dark Horse Presents. And we we're like, oh, we're in like this is. Super exciting. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> It had Burns name on it, so it became extra exciting because mm -hmm. you know, who didn't love John Burns' creations? Mm -hmm. And but like it was clear, like th th it was a winner right off the bat. And you know, John saying to to, to Mike, like, "You don't need me. Like, mm -hmm. th 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 there's no reason for me to be here." And that, like, th that's the greatest act of generosity. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know. to, to give something up entirely and realize that you, this is better off without you. I mean, yeah. that's, an, that's enormous, you know? Right. Um, yeah, because he could have been like Stan Lee going, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I need to have my name on this Hellboy crap, you know? It needs to be yeah. John Burns Hellboy. And then, of course, we wouldn't have Hellboy because it would have crashed and burned, you know? Oh, boom. Um, ooh, hoo, hoo. Um, yeah, and, you know, oh, God. So that's, that's another weird little aside is one of my other recent jack of all trades things is i started doing special features for documentaries okay. um, on on dvds and blu-rays which um was just something that happened and now i've done quite a few of them with arrow films and i did a folklore and hellboy special feature for the recent uh, mignola documentary oh really and, yeah i was just like i filmed it and i was just terrified uh for Mignola to just watch it and be like that's all wrong everything <laughs> you said is just wrong um and just two days ago he dm'd me saying you know saw the documentary it was great you know thanks Aww. so much for participating it was just like oh, i could breathe again oh thank yeah. god you know he, he's so he's so kind at, at, at every turn so he is he is it, it, it's yeah it, it, it's it would it's no surprise he he yeah. loved it he i mean he's the thing is is that like he is so much a fan of all this stuff as well. Yep. You know, just just like a Neil Gaiman, these people are just mm -hmm. they're such super fans of it that mm -hmm. they don't they 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 can find love in all of it. Like yep. it really is something they can all look at and go like, oh, I just love this or I love that. Yep. It, it's 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 an amazing trait and it's something we should all emulate. Mm -hmm. And just I mean like. I know some people will say like Mignola is grumpy and he, I mean, he's a little grumpy. I mean, I don't, but I don't think of him that way at all because he's just been one of those people that's been, although, you know, like we're talking about shrapnel, Mignola is very much a part of my, once again, shrapnel, yeah. which, you know, I, cause I've been coming to him as a fan for decade, you know, yeah. more. And he, I think eventually maybe and started remembering this, dude just coming to him every single time you know um and i started giving him some of my first writing you know which was just uh nothing it was just like you know my blog essentially and i would print out my blog and i would hand it to him at the conventions you know and then the next time he came he would be like oh you're back do you have more for me and, and you know like but just that simple encouragement right of him saying like oh wow i actually read what you wrote and enjoyed it you know um was immense to me and made me 
give me gave me that confidence to think like, okay, maybe this is something I literally can do professionally. If someone like like Mignola is li- like enjoying what I do, um, maybe it can go somewhere. Maybe it can lead something. To something. Yeah, I mean, he kicked the door wide open in the American market for that folklore, you know, mm-hmm. adventure world where I think we all have you know just been happy that there's so much wonderful sort of pro, you know films and television Mm -hmm. books being you know written and created over this stuff and i think it's it's great because we get to see all this beauty and the yeah because it's 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 just there's nothing greater than the concept of the secret world oh yeah oh absolutely yeah that's like i don't care how you manifest it but if you Mm -hmm. do it well i'm in like i'm so so in and mm-hmm. yeah, and and I think Mike Mike was you know really one of the four you know forefathers of that. Mm-hmm. And Mike Mike does this is you know something that was mentioned on the documentary that I thought was really true too. Is one of the things that I love about Mike is he does not attempt to explain or rationalize stuff. Like to me, when it comes to folklore and the supernatural, the dullest thing on earth that you can ever do is explain something. You know, yeah. um, and I feel the same way about. Star Wars, you know, like Star Wars to me is mythology and folklore. Yeah. And the instant you start telling me that a lightsaber is made up of kyber crystals that are sure. mined on this thing and assembled, yeah. it's like, like, Mah. you know, it's so dull. It's so completely dull. Like, I do not need to know how the magic sword works, you know? Um, right. Yeah, it's it, it is. It's one of these things. I mean, it, it's it's tantamount to the, you know, the or parallel with, uh, you know, explaining a joke. You know, like it's you're not making whatever you said funny by yep. telling you that it's the concept is funny. Yep. And that's I mean, and that's also a concept like it's has long been a concept in folklore that one of the ways that you can depower something is to name it. You know, by naming something sure. you, you take true. away yeah, you steal away its um its magic. And I feel that that is true in storytelling too. I feel like the instant that you start saying that the force comes from midi chlorines, you have now yep. stolen the magic. You know, the instant that a you know, and but I, I also once again, I understand that there's other people who feel differently that like getting in the needs of the wit, you know, the stuff like that, and the, I'm like that's sure. that's fine. But um, yeah, I guess I like magic. You know, like mm-hmm. you know, g- transporting myself into Tolkien's realm as a kid yep. was the greatest thing I could do. Seeing Star Wars in 1977 as a nine year old mm-hmm. was, you know, was life changing, and it was change it life changing because. You know, reading the Micronauts in 1979 was like, God, I love the Micronauts because yeah. it was this, it was, it was a different world. It was a mm-hmm. hidden world. It was all these things that, and I didn't need explanation. Like, it's like, wait a minute, there could be a whole universe, you know, in the molecules between my, you know, between, you know, the space between yep. the molecules in my hand. Holy, you know, like that yeah. was exciting. Yep. Yeah. And it's also one of those things where it's like, don't think about it too much though, no. because no. You know, just allow it to have its magic and mystery. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that was something, so I read, I did a book called The Art of Star Wars Visions for Dark Horse and Lucasfilm, and I interviewed a lot of, like, I don't know if you saw the Star Wars Visions project at all, it was on Netflix, it's, like, it's on, no, it's on Disney Plus, yeah, and yeah. basically, they gave all of these Japanese animators free reign, like, you can yes. do Star Wars, yes, and you can yes, literally yes, yes. do anything you want with it, it's non-continuity, go to town, um, yeah. and I interviewed a lot of those directors and writers for that book, and they all universally said that to them, Star Wars is fantasy. Like Star yeah. Wars is not science fiction. Like it is basically fantasy with the trappings of science fiction. And yeah. so all of them push that fantasy element far more, you know, uh, whether they were mm-hmm. telling like a Pinocchio story or they were telling, you know, whatever story they wanted to tell, none of them were concerned about the technical aspects of a lightsaber, you know, like one, right. one of them just gets ridiculous. They have this lightsaber that grows like, you know, a mile long and cuts a <laughs> star destroyer in half. And the director's why like, not? why not? You know, yeah. why not? Yeah. Why worry about the technical length of a kyber crystal that can only contain a blade, you know, X meters long and all this other stuff. They're like, we're doing star Wars, baby. Woo. Yeah. Chop that thing in half, you know? Um, well, that's, I, yeah, no, you're right, man. It's, it, it is, I mean, and I think it's like for me, you know, while on so many levels, wonderful technical achievements and production achievements, like for mm-hmm. what they're doing on the Disney Channel with Star Wars, I don't need the explanations. I don't need nope. the backstories. What I, what I, I mean, that's why I'm enjoying 
even though it's a backstory. I, I really am enjoying Andor because it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, what we've been what we've yep. been sort of fed for mm. you know forty five years. Yeah. Um, you know, like I don't need more Skywalker world. I just need, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. Was, you know, that was one of the funny things in Star Wars Visions is one of the characters was a rabbit. Uh, they did this rabbit and called Lop. And when I asked the director, like, why did you choose a rabbit? He's like, you know what? I wanted to choose a design that could in no way ever be a Star Wa or Skywalker or a Palpatine. He's like, I am sick to death yeah. of everyone being a Skywalker. So he's like, you get a you get a force wielding rabbit, baby. And I'm like, all yeah. right. Well, because it's because it, you know you what you said about being fantasy, like it's it, it's fantasy that gets boiled down to being the Hatfields and the McCoys, and that's like yep. we do, like that's not. That's that doesn't mm -hmm. take me away. That kind of brings me down, and I don't mm -hmm. want to do that. So, well, yeah, mm -hmm. and and it's like because Star Wars and like the original Star Wars at its core is one of the foundational myths of humanity. We always, yeah. it's King Arthur. It is the boy king who draws the sword from the stone. You know, yep. um, he's Arthur. Han Solo is clearly Lancelot, you know, right. Princess Leia is clearly Guinevere, and Darth Vader is clearly Mordred. Um, they just did a swap instead of Arthur's son, now he's Arthur's father, right? So you've got this core mythology, and core mythology is so powerful. It resonates. Whether people understand it or not, it just resonates, you know? Um, and Lucas did such a great job with those first two pictures just really resonating on that. And then the third picture, it was still amazing, but it got a little bit weaker because, you know... Um, Lucas just started. I think he had more power by then, and so he was maybe able to put, put more of his it's goofier like, ideas in there. Yeah, and I, I also think like that's like you know we were we were kind of talking about mm -hmm. that a little bit earlier. Is that that's when creators like it's like adding the kid into the comic book, thinking mm -hmm. that it's going to be the thing. Yep. It's 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 trying to service a specific audience mm -hmm. versus making the best product possible and when you make the best thing possible people will find the best thing yep. they need to have like oh here's my entry point my entry point is the thing that is similar to me or oh there's a car chase in this i love car chases mm -hmm. you know like you know yep you know and, or, yeah totally and that's another reason why I think like well, the, the Disney, I haven't seen Andor yet. I'm I'm looking for, I've got actually kind of like reserving that one because to me, it just didn't feel like a fall show, which is why I haven't watched it. It didn't feel like an October show. So we watch October, we're watching horror movies. It feels like yeah, a December okay. show. So that's yeah, when we're going to watch it. Um, but like Mandalorian was another, like Mandalorian is one of those ones where it's just like the core concept is mm -hmm. instantly appealing. You know, yep. you've got um, Grizzly Warrior and Cutie and Cute yep. Baby. I mean, Ba -bong. Yeah, that's, totally. that's a, a brilliant core concept that everyone can buy into um, and does not necessarily require any further explanation, which I thought was great. Yeah. And it's in it. What it does is it builds on lore on something that is not part of the core thing. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, the book of Boba Fett is about this specific character from these movies mm -hmm. versus a individual from mm -hmm. a class or a planet or a race that we don't know and now yeah. we learn about this person and to mm -hmm. me that's a way more interesting you know conceit yeah yeah and, yeah. I, and I also think like that's how you know you know once again to, to circle around a little bit you know when we talk about like you know the use of folklore and stuff and like I also think that that's how these stories you know even if you don't recognize the tropes at some psychic level you there's resonance with these mm -hmm. old stories um and so you just kind of get that for free and uh mike, mike mignola would say he's like i feel like cheating sometime because basically all i'm doing is rewriting folk tales sure. and because you haven't read them before you suddenly right. think it's this new and interesting idea and i'm like but that is the proper way to tell folk stories like folk yeah. tales you the proper thing to do with them is to take the core fa foundational elements and create something that resonates with a modern audience i mean that sure. is not that is not cheating. That is being a human storyteller, which is what you're supposed to do. You know, it's exactly the stories he's the, the these stories are the ones that get passed down. You know, mm -hmm. for for millennia, and yep. we that's that's the job of the storyteller. And yep. you know, you know, let's say Mike has twelve different story threads that he's he's worked over. It anybody can pick up the Baba Yaga thing and do their own Baba Yaga. 
Mm -hmm. and it doesn't, you're not copying Mike. You're not, you, you are well, telling a Baba Yaga story. Yeah, how could you be? It's not like he invented Baba Yaga, no. you know, right. exactly. Yeah. And, and Mignola and I, like, that's also like the, the Japanese artist, Mizuki Shigeru, who I, you know, who's one of my favorites along with Mignola. He's essentially the same thing. You know, he's taking these folkloric myths, these very old stories, and he's just telling them in a modern way. Although his stories, which are very different from Mike's, his stories are highly political. They are immensely <laughs> layered with sociology and philosophy and all of these like layers and layers of depth to them. Yeah. Um, that is not apparent at first read. At first read, you might say, oh, wow, that was a weird, wacky story. But then as soon as you peel into it, you feel like he's he's subliminally adding in all these elements that you may not have been aware of until you start to sort of like dive down and understand what all he's writing about. Okay, so that that actually leads me to a question that, I, that mm -hmm. I've been thinking about with you specifically for days now. Mm -hmm. um, so my my favorite of the of the Mongo people is mm -hmm. uh, Masamune Shiro. Like oh sure yeah that guy mm -hmm. I, is you know just unbelievable skill sets all over the place. But did you read any of his stuff before you learned to speak Japanese? No, I didn't. I well, no, I, did I? Yes, yes. I've read all of Shiro's stuff in translation first. Okay, good. Okay, so, so yeah, this, oh good. Yeah. So then, have you read his stuff? in japanese yeah so. i read um i read not a lot of it i read ghost of the shell in japanese okay. that was one of the ones that i was when i was learning japanese i was like all right i'm going to try and tackle ghost of the shell not a smart move because his work is it's dense. very complex and dense and not exactly learner friendly but yeah <laughs> well i'm just i'm curious yeah. on, on a translation level this is really the nuts and mm -hmm. bolts thing the the english version that we have is it is it the same story, so to speak, or is there is there are there many layers that are not being connected? So, Ghost of the Shell and Shiro stuff is in. So, when translation first started happening during the eighties and nineties, um, there was a couple real like people on the forefront that set the Thorne. stage. You had yeah, people like Fred, yeah, like yeah, Thorin Smith. You had people like Fred Schatz. You had a uh, Dana yeah. who did a uh, Lone Wolf and Cub. And their translation style at the time, um, which was good translation style at the time, this is how stuff changes, um, was to spin it more for Western audiences. Okay. You know, um, So you wanted to make it sellable to Western audiences, which meant that you were not necessarily as concerned about accuracy of storyline um, because you wanted it to be more, even like, like the title Ghost in the Shell, for example, a complete inner invention. Okay. Um, of the yeah of the uh, the localizer, um, they're all over the place like that. Battle Angel Alita character is not even named Alita in the original story. Right. You know, character's name is Galley, and the um, title would translate something roughly as Gun Dream, um, which actually I thought was a badass title. But Battle Angel, badass. yeah. But uh, Battle Angel, like Ghost of the Shell's title, it's like I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's something like mobilized police force would okay, have been sure. the actual translation yeah. of ghost of the cell something like mechanized police force or something like that um very mundane and yeah. somebody you know some localizer came up with the idea of ghost of the shell which is brilliant it's great you know sure. it's fantastic it resonates so much more um and they would just they would just freely change things very very freely change things oh, back in that okay. style um so reading it nowadays you know my first when I was reading it in Japanese, my first idea was like, oh, they did this wrong. And I think that's one stage of level of learning a foreign language is you start, to, or especially learning the art of translation. You're like, oh, this is wrong because it's different. And then later you realize, oh, this is brilliant because they captured the same feeling and they did it with entirely different words. So I will say that like, like Ghost of the Shell, like the emotional beats are all there. You know, all of that, but they definitely lose a lot of the layering political nuances and and yeah. things like that. And there's just no way to not do that. Like when I'm translating Mizuki Shigeru's work, like there'll there'll definitely be times where I'm just like look at something and you look at the sentence, you know, and you look at all the meaning that's layered there and you like 
pat it on the head and you tell it it's very, a very good boy and then you send it away into the realm of lost in translation, you know, because right. there's a reason why the word lost and the phrase lost in translation exists is because something will always be lost in translation. Right. Um, and as a translator, you just have to be okay with that. You have to be like, all right, this is just how it works. You are gone. I'm not capturing that meaning. Um, a lot of clever wordplay. And there's different ways around that. Like you could, you can write footnotes in the back, you know, and then all of a sudden, that book now longer becomes what the author intended, which was this enjoyable read, but now becomes study session. You know, now you're not enjoying the story. You're flipping to the back to say like, this Ooh, turn of phrase, yeah. yeah, actually, blah, 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 you know, um, and that's not, that's not why he wrote the book, you know, that's right, not that's, what he did. But to that point, Shiro actually does that. Yeah, in and if, by writing yeah. in the writing in the margins. Yeah, and if they do that intentionally, then absolutely you capture that. Yeah. Like that's important. Yeah. But when you start adding that stuff in, because you are afraid to make the brave choice to understand that you're going to lose this meaning yeah. and to move on with it. Like I actually like I think of translation notes as a bit of a crutch um, for translators because it's basically your way of saying I have failed as a translator. I have sure. failed to capture this meaning. Yeah. Um, I have not come up with a good way to do this. And so I'm going to basically do this crutch, you know, and put this right. in the back. It's writing. If you, you know, if you're really thinking about it, it's writing. Mm -hmm. So what you were handed is you're handed a manuscript in a different language. Mm -hmm. And now you are the person who has to write the story yep. and the art and the craft of, you know, writing, you know, his his manicured fingers glistened like an ice cube under the hot mm. you know, hot desert sun. Okay, mm -hmm. now that that says a lot, but that's but like if you just go like he had shiny fingernails, <laughs> yeah, okay. like it says, but, yeah, yeah. But and then, and it's even more than that because the way that the obviously language works in cultural context, like for example, there's a. Um, there's a piece in Kitaro where one of the characters, Nezumi Otoko, very casually steals a persimmon from a tree, right? Right. Not a big deal, unless you're aware that the persimmon thief is one of the great works of Japanese playwright Ziyami. And so, um, you know, it's like, there's like, you know, like you have to have this understanding of all these cultural contexts, you know, like imagine once again, without these cultural contexts, say, I have a story where I, a guy very casually walks up and pulls a sword from a stone. Yeah. I never explain it. You know, it's just right. a thing that happens, you know. Yeah. Um, but you, the Japanese side has that cultural context. So the stealing of a persimmon yes. means more to a Japanese audience that understands classic Japanese literature and plays than it does to a Western audience where that context is entirely lost. You know, yeah. just completely lost um so, yeah that is super interesting because we are you, because because of that i mean there's so much more that can't be translated mm -hmm. that even, oh, yeah. if, even if it was the perfect translation yep it still would not exist because we wouldn't know because you lose all of that cultural context yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you could have like another character, like you could suddenly have an, like another character, like throw a bit of like you can. Then there's different ways you can tackle that. You can put a little note at the bottom saying like the stealing of this persimmon is blah, blah. Sure. But it was but it was a throwaway reference. You know, it was a little wink and a nod. I mean, yeah. imagine if you're watching a movie and, you know, like his movies will do this all the time. Like imagine you're watching Star Wars and all of a sudden a Wilhelm scream comes on. Yeah. And instead of just not enjoying the moment a pop-up pops up on the screen, say, the Wilhelm screen is a classic sound effect used by blah, 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 you know? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. totally pulls you in, out of the story, which is not what the author intended. The author intended just a little side reference, and those who get it, get it, you know? And those who don't, it doesn't destroy the story. It doesn't sidetrack the story. Um, yeah. So, like, the, the, I mean, it's interesting because, like, with pop culture, the ubiquity of pop culture and the predominance sort of how it spreads, especially American pop culture around the world. Like maybe, you know, cause maybe you think of like ready player one, like a mm -hmm. translation of ready player one might not be the best selling book around the world because people might not be getting, you know, 90% of those references because mm -hmm. 
or watching 80s television or whatever the you know yep. whatever the stuff is so yeah um, i will i will say there are however there are some agrarious versions of that where uh, like i think the worst one is possibly uh battle royale where so battle royale is very involved in japanese culture and you know and very much involved in japanese society yeah and for a long time the creator of battle royale did not want his work translated especially in america because he's like right. all americans will do is glom on to the violence like yep. they will only see that and they will lose the message entirely and then uh the comic got translated into english and it was just an atrocity like they took it and they actually like they basically took the visuals and they rewrote a brand new story to go with it that involved like this reality game show right. where students were being killed and it was just it was so bad and i think that yes as a translator there is some element of rewriting but i think that there is just like everything else there's a bridge too far you know you yeah. and battle royale is one of them which is why i We'll say that to this day battle royale has never been put in english because the only version that exists of the comic is just a disgrace just an absolute disgrace yeah, that's a bummer yeah there's one i could redo that would be the one well maybe you can maybe you can maybe you can get that to happen what's the um how long do you think it takes you to uh in japanese let's say read ghost in the shell just a curiosity uh like me personally yeah, just i mean it's it's just a volume, so you know, a couple hours maybe. Yeah. So next time I'm up your way, mm -hmm. yeah, I, you you can read it to me so I can understand. <laughs> that that would definitely be a difficult, more difficult thing because reading and explaining is always going to be a little more complicated. Yeah, so but like, yeah, so I'll come out. Mm -hmm. It'll be like a week long vacation. You yep. know, you could you could read to me from sections every you day. Know, the other great. one of the interesting things about Ghost of the Shell also is that they edited out all the sex very famously yes yes there's there's a which, lot of, um, i have a lot of the japanese stuff yeah which uh master Munishiro is fine with because he has said uh that he never even wanted to put those scenes in there anyways but his editor told him he needed to put some sex scenes in there so <laughs> there are um, there actually are times where the western version of something is actually the artist's preferred version of the story oh, really? because he's able yeah because just like um just like a lot of, you know, like George Lucas, you know, how, you know, artists will tinker with yeah. their versions. And so he's like, oh, you mean I get to do a version of this free from the influence of editorial? Well, let me tinker with that. And that is the version that I actually would have preferred to have told were I allowed to do so at the time. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's super interesting. Yeah. And there's so, been attempts to put like, to put the sex scenes back in the Ghost in the Shell. And as far as I know, Shiro is one of the loudest voices in saying like, no. It. Right. Yeah, no, I got the opportunity to cut them out, you know, no. Oh, good, well, good, well, I mean, good mm -hmm. for him, I guess. Um, although all his illustration books would say otherwise. Um, yeah, I'm like any artist, I'm sure his mood changes as they go, you know, it's just like, I heard that Steven Spielberg is putting the guns back into E.T. now after removing them for walkie-talkies, you know, so okay. people change as time goes on. Yeah, well, no one... less reactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one is beholden to their one opinion they've had their entire lives. No, no. And maybe hopefully one day we'll get the original Star Wars cut available to watch. Right? Maybe. I've certainly, yeah, I've certainly had opinions that that I look at back now as, a, as a, you know, someone in my 50s, and I'm like, geez, I was stupid back then. That's just embarrassing oh, that I ever thought yeah. that. Oh, you for know? sure. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's you know, and that's why like it's so it's so painful when you see people being persecuted for something they had said or done so many years ago. You're like, man, like we we hopefully we we are different people and mm -hmm. evolving and improving as we move along. Well, and I'm so glad that I grew up in the pre um, ubiquitous cell phone era, where not every single stupid thing I ever had was captured for eternity. So, yeah, no kidding. So, right for writing, like how did so how did writing become like? I mean, I'm talking like. Uh -huh. I'm talking, you know, fictional writing. Mm -hmm. How did that become something you started getting your hands doing as a as a professional level? So fictional writing, I started like, and this was this. So I I've always enjoyed doing fiction writing just as a personal hobby, you know. Um, and translation had taken over my career because I had become pretty successful at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, and this was interesting. So. When I first started doing translation, I kind of had what I called my my hope shelf. So I had all the stuff that I wanted to work on. These were like my dream projects. 
Yeah. And I did them all. I literally did every single one of them. And my last great one was Space Battleship Yamato, the book I had grown up on. It was the it was the Holy Grail. I used yeah. to call it the Holy Grail. You know, it's like, and then I did it. And when I was done with it, I realized like, you know, I was like, I was, you know, Alexander the Great where and I have no more worlds to conquer. And so he right. wept, you know. I had literally done everything I had set out to do as a translator. And so then I was just like so had that sort of crisis just like I was at Amazon. I'm like, so what now? You know, what do I do? Do I just go back into cracking stuff out for paychecks? You know, do I look for new stuff to fall in love with? You know, um, uh, you know, and like I've done writing and do I really just start to focus on my writing? You know, do I, am I able to make a career change from translator to, to writer, you know? And yeah. so that was kind of a goal I set for myself because my, you know, my wife was very encouraging about that too, because I was working on a few translations and I just hated them. I was just like, she's just like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I got to work on this thing. She's like, you know, every time you sit down to your computer to translate, you look like you're sitting on a bed of nails anymore. Um, and she's like, why don't you just stop? And I'm like, okay, you know, I decided that, you know, and I didn't want to just stop. What I wanted to do was just be very, I'm like, all right, I'm going to be a very selective translator. You know, translator is no going to be, only, and I want to start doing more writing. You know, I want to push myself to do more writing because that's what, that's what I feel like I want to do right now. Um, right. And it, when you're, when you're known for something, it's especially when you're known for something, you know, in the fandom sense, it's very hard. Sometimes the fans are not encouraging of you transitioning out yeah. of that role, you know, um, and I got invited to work on Demon Days with Peach Momoko, which was, you know, my first writing gig for Marvel. And it was so funny because everyone to this day keeps assuming it's a translation because that's what I do. And I have to t constantly, constantly retell people that, no, Demon Days is not a translation. There is no, there is no Japanese original. It is not a translation. Um, but people, you know, just they just have this assumption, you know, it must sure. be, it must be a translation because Pete Momoko is Japanese and Zach Davison is a Japanese translator. So it ergo, the drummer. yeah, right. <laughs> ergo, it is, you know, um, and it is, it is like being in a band where you were the drummer and now you're like, oh, I want to be the lead singer now. And people were just like, no, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was really glad that, uh, you know, C.B. Sobolski had the faith in me to, pull, to, you know, basically tap me for that. And also that Peach was able to, you know, basically hand me over the reins of, of you know, I'm not the reins entirely, but obviously just maybe one reign there of what we were doing. And I think we managed to build something really cool together that, you know, neither of us would have done individually because we're just right. a magnificent team. So, yeah. And, well, you, if anybody is curious about the, the, the process, you actually have a very clear breakdown of it pinned yep. on your Twitter, Twitter feed. So, it would be, be wise for people to like, go like, wait yeah. a minute, let me, let me, let me figure this out. Yeah. Cause it's, and not, I, it's not standard. It's like, no, it's, it's not, but it is standard. And if you really think of it, it's, it's basically old school Marvel method. I mean, that's, Marvel. yeah, that's really what it is. It's old school Marvel method. It's, um, you know, it's what Stan Lee would do for Jack Kirby essentially is what I did for Pete Romoko. So, right. um, you know, I get these pages and they are just pages of art. Yeah. And then I have, uh, you know, rough plot stories and plot things. And then I just basically take the story and I, I, I try to make a story out of it, too, because a lot of times, like, you know, Peach, her artwork, you know, she, you know, what's in her head is she understands it completely. But mm -hmm. um, it's hard for her to get other people to understand these story points without, because um, she's not, you know, as she herself has said, like, like she's not good at the dialogue part of it you know she's right. good at the art part of it um and she wishes like you know it's funny with peach because i i know her well enough and her artwork well enough she's like you know her dream is if everyone just didn't need the words like she would mm -hmm. love it so much if people could just get the entire story from the art um and you know maybe sometimes you can but at the same time this is comics and we like to have dialogue and we like to have you know these sort of like expressions of personality um and I also, I, I bring the Marvel to the book because Peach doesn't know Marvel comics very right. well at all. And um, I remember one of the funniest things that we did when we were, when I was, di when I was dialoguing, because I not only die, so I dialogue the books, I also do all the special effects. And I put a, um, we had a, you know, Nightcrawler in there and I put Bamf in there. 
And Peach is like, what the hell is this? And I'm What's like, right yeah, I'm like, she's like, I'm like, trust me, no, Nightcrawler goes bam. Like, you just got to trust me on this one, Peach. It's a, it's a persimmon being stolen. It has, it means mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, it is. It's the persimmon being stolen, right? And yeah. there's a few different things I've done in there, um, you know, where you'll just like, you're like, oh, I'm going to throw in a thwip or I'm going to throw in a snick or I'm going to throw in these, you know, these. <laughs> and I, and the I, snick, they'll take care of things. Yeah. And it was like, you know, and I'm like, these these kind of things will allow Marvel readers to feel comfortable that they are in the Marvel universe. You sure. know, it's when they feel and I, you know, that's one of the things that I really bring to the series as well is like this sense of like, all right, if we have this character speak of this thing or say this thing, it's, you know, it's comforts the readers knowing that they are reading within their their existing Marvel framework, even though the stuff that's happening might have absolutely nothing to do with the characters that they're familiar with, yeah. even though they're called the same names and things like that. Uh, yeah, no, I, and, and, I mean, yeah. yeah, and I'm sure for, on the editorial level, that's a great comfort to them because it's, yeah, it's well, our, yeah, and our editor Lindsay is just, she's just great. I mean, she's so fantastic, and she does like the best job of what an editor should do, which is balancing. Um, between me and Peach, you know, between both of our strengths and everything, because like yeah. she'll, you know, like Peach will get the art and then I will inevitably, you know, I will dialogue the story and then it's a matter of pairing stuff back, you know, like what do we need? You know, what have you over explained? What do we not need here? You know, things like mm -hmm. that, just sort of like pairing it back down. And then we do a lot of back and forth um, until, which is part of the process of comics I love so much, like the collaborative aspect of it, of like, pitching ideas back and forth and coming up with something that everyone's had. And sometimes it takes a while, man. We'll do like four or five different exchanges until we wow. hit whatever yeah. that, that magic thing is that makes it all work. And then you see it on the page and you're like, worth it. You know, that was yeah. all worth it. You know, it's interesting you said how, how she's like sort of, you know, dialogue adverse. And mm -hmm. I remember for years, the terror when it came to writing was dialogue. Like mm -hmm. it was like, it's funny because when you're drawing, you know, you're acting, you know, you're acting mm -hmm. these characters out. So all yep. the, the behaviors and mannerisms are the storytelling devices that they would be, you know, uh, an actor would employ. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, but the idea of putting words down to sort of like go with that always felt like a terrifying process. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I get that instinct and, you know, and from her. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're doing, you're doing, a, you're doing a great service in that respect. Well, and I mean, just like everything else, like art, I mean, and the words, and especially in comics, is there all has to be a resonance between what's going with, and, you know, like, because that's, that's another thing with me as a, as a comic writer and working in comics is because I come from a manga background, I tend to be far less wordy than other comic writers, you know, who come from maybe a prose background, like our, our letter, Ariana Mayer, she said that basically mine and Jody Hauser's scripts are the most, um, clean scripts that she ever gets to work with you know she's like oh, so many other writers are just cluttered with words as if they're yeah. being paid by the word whereas i tend to you know just be very succinct with the words i'm like all right so this is the story that we're telling here um this is the dialogue that needs to happen that gives heart and gives emotion to these characters you know helps move the story forward but then just like just as much as possible to strip out all the rest of it you know even if i think something's clever or interesting or wacky you know i'll just try to pull that out of there but i mean yeah. that's not to say that i don't like because i also in my own dialogue writing style like i really like um and i think everyone probably does you know like i like resonance of language and so i have a lot of things where um i'll use the same phrase multiple times throughout you know so that there's this like sort of like echoing sensation of dialogue that goes through um you know i just did that with the miracle man story that i scripted for peach where you know, this, this guy gets a key. And so I wrote this like little piece of dialogue where it's like, you know, well, I can't even remember what it is like, you know, a key opens a, a key opens a door, a door is a threshold. And there was like this sort of like little sort of like poetic piece to it that then gets repeated throughout the story to, mm -hmm. to build that sort of resonance in the dialogue. Yeah. And it's and as, as a sort of a structural device for, the, for the, you know, on the, le on the writing side, mm -hmm. you keep reinforcing something, you know, yep. It becomes it becomes sort of you know i don't know it becomes foundational in whatever the story is like it it has it has a great power so what like so i mean 
you you got a you got a pretty big you know popular book out there right now like what mm -hmm. like are you are you writing your own stuff like coming up are you pitching things like what's the I am I'm currently working on a couple different pitches that I'm going to pitch uh that CB has asked me to put together a pitch for so I'm going to pitch him um hopefully that goes well we'll see like everything fingers crossed um yeah I also just have in my inbox right now a contract for a new book with a uh, a different publisher that I have to look over the contract to sign okay. and, you know, so it's a couple exciting. different, yeah, it is, it is exciting. It is exciting. Um, and it's really been like, you know, I was like, you know, I don't know. There's a weird age thing where I'm like, I was like, so I started translating when I turned 40 mm -hmm. and then I just recently turned 50 and I'm like, all right, this is my new thing from 50. I'm going to be a writer, you know, yeah. I'm going to, move into this and so far that plan seems to be going pretty well but then you know it's scary because it's all up to you to, to succeed on or fail you know i mean it's like i want to do this and so i have to prove that i can do it you know just like you like you with the comic it's like all right write me a story it's like hey i want to write a story for marvel okay do it make it yeah. a good story you know um yeah. like oh shit okay i guess i gotta do that then Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it, it you know, I, I guess good wasn't even a question for me. Like, mm -hmm. it, was just, it had to be, you know, because why would I want to write a not good story? You know, right? I yeah. I didn't want to draw a not good story. Yep. So that would only make sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I've, I mean, done, I've done a couple smaller things, like James Tyrion did uh, his uh, horror anthology Razor Blades. So oh, I wrote right. some. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote some stuff for Razor Blades and I've wrote like a couple, you know, little short ones here and there, you know. Um, but no, like big thing, yeah. And I think you know, like, like I don't, I don't know. I've got a, like everyone has a lot of ideas, but ideas by themselves are worthless. It's really what you can do with the scrap of turning them into something, you know. Yeah, so a blank pages of no value to to really anyone. Yeah, no matter except how many, except the person, yeah. person who wants to put something on it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but I do want to, you know, I do want to hopefully capitalize on Demon Days and hopefully, you know, turn it into some something different, you know, something else that I can, um, you know, do more writing with. But at the same time, like, it's comics, so I want to collaborate more than yeah. I just want to write something by myself. But I think I'm going to do, I like, I don't know, I'm going to definitely do a new um, fiction book, too, because I've done one fiction prose book that I really like, but I like doing illustrated fiction books because I just... Mm -hmm. I think the art is there is just so much fun. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's, that's look forward to cool things. <laughs> well, I, it's, it, I mean, listen, it's great. I mean, I, it's, it's tough shifting gears, mm -hmm. but it is, there is nothing more, you know, energizing mm -hmm. than seeing the path, you know, ahead of you and where, and where you want to go, you know, mm -hmm. and, really like making all the efforts that you can to get to that next step, that next step mm -hmm. and those things. And, you know, I mean, f fortunately you're not like trying to break it into industry. You have no, in, in no sort of mm -hmm. like professional familiarity with you. You were already ingrained in it. So now mm -hmm. it's a matter of just shifting your position in that, in that market. And, yep. uh, and I, it, it, I don't see that being an issue in, clearly you're working on projects with some attention so mm -hmm. yeah and i've also like you know i've never really set out like i don't necessarily want to be the superstar you know i don't really care about being the hot person or the hot thing i, I mean the fact that i'm working on a hot book now with with peach is entirely just luck because i've known peach for years you know i've known peach for so many years back when nobody knew who peach was you know um which is just bizarre to see her suddenly take off. Oh my God, it is so weird. And it's it it's so great. Yeah. yeah. Um, she That was another one of those funny things where she had no idea. Like I, she was coming to New York Comic Con and I think a lot of people heard what happened to her at New York Comic Con, which was a shame. But I also kept telling her, I'm like, Peach, you don't understand how popular you are mm -hmm. and how much of a commotion you being here. Because the last time she was here in uh, 2019 at Emerald City Comic Con, um she had like a signing at a local comic shop that like maybe three people came to and i was one of them um yeah. like literally no one came you know she was just sitting there and we were hanging out and like she did some art for me and it was a lot of fun because i like peach so much and we were just chitty chatting and i'm like peach you will never get to have that again like you Ooh. i'm sorry you know but because she's so far removed from it she doesn't really know you know 
in theory, she's like, oh, yeah, I know people like my covers, but she wasn't prepared for that level of superstardom. So, no, it, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. And I, I, it's, you know, I mean, th thankfully, you know, the people who, you know, we have good friend friendship and mm -hmm. relationship with the people when they go through that. Yep. So there's usually it's a pretty good thing for them, but it's a weird thing to see it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so, although that's, you know, and speaking of friendships, I got to add that, like, that's easily the best thing that I've built out of, out of working in comics is the, you yeah. know, the, the friends you made along the way is such a cliche, but at the same time, it's Wednesday and this Wednesday means it's Dungeon and Dragons night. So Hell me yeah. and Jim Zub and Jody Hauser and Jackson Lansing and like all these other comic folks, we get together and we play Dungeons and Dragons every single Wednesday. So uh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I had Jim on the show last month and or oh months. nice. Yeah, no, I mean the, the yeah D and D and like you're right, man. The friendships are. I mean, like you know, I got out of the business of you know in 1999, mm. and but like the, the people who you know they're they're just people in my life for the rest mm -hmm. of my life and. Yep no matter what the break was in between of working, working in that and then coming back and doing the podcast mm -hmm. for people and like meeting you or anybody else, like we're all like the same people, you know, versions of the same people who have this passion for like the things mm -hmm. that we love. And it doesn't matter if the thing that you love is different than the thing that I love. I love that fact that you love the thing that you love and you love mm -hmm. the fact that I love what I love. Totally. And it's like, so we can all kind of get excited to build on that. And I, you know, and I also think, you know, what, what you said was into getting out of the business is that's another thing where I'm trying, I am trying to be realistic with the understanding that the career in comics doesn't last forever. You know, right. um, that was something that uh, was told to me. Oh my God, where, why can I not think of his name? I just blanked on his name, which is another thing that happens when you get old and uh, <laughs> Gwen Stacy guy. Wait. Death of Gwen Stacy. Um, why am I blanking on his name? I don't oh want to say Rod, not Roger Stern. No, 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 no. Uh, writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you now we'll have to cut this part out where my brain farts because. Um... <laughs> all right, hold on. I'm Googling now to try and clue right, it. Do it. And then it's going to come and I'm gonna be like, oh my God, how am I so Lord. dumb? Um, I see his name in my head. Yeah, I do too. Uh, his face, everything in, my, in his head. All right. Oh my God, Gary Conway. God, I can't believe I blanked on Gary Conway. It starts with the yeah. C. Yeah. I know. So, um, so one of the things that really was interesting to me is I, I was at this convention. This was when I was doing, um, I was basically doing comics journalism per se, but it was really like a lot of comics people. Like, there's different steps you can get up on the comics ladder, and one of them yeah. is to write for a comics website because then you get the press pass and you go in. Right. And I was interviewing um, Gary Conway and um, and uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick stopped by, and she had just started writing uh, Ms. Marvel at the time, so she actually brought her Ms. Marvel number one to get signed uh, by Gary. And Gary right. was like, yeah. He was, he, "Yeah, he was like, he was like." Um, he said this thing to her that had so much impact on me. And again, it was one of those things he probably barely remembers even saying it, but he just, he looked at her and he's like, it doesn't last. You have your moment and it's great and you should cherish that, but you should understand that it doesn't last and you need to plan for that. Yeah. And I was just like, I was like, I've always thought about that. I'm like, yeah, I have this time in comics and it's great. And kid me would be so thrilled to know that I've made accomplishments, but when it's gone, I'll be happy. I'll be at peace with that because I'll have known that I did stuff, you know, I did cool stuff, you know, sure. um, and eventually someone, you know, younger, the new hotness, whatever it is, you know, will come in and I'm just totally at peace for that. There'll be a time where I, where I don't go to conventions anymore, except for as a yep. spectator. And I wander around to see some people, old friends. And I'll be like, Oh, Hey, and then we like, you tabling. And I'm like, no, you know, that's what I do, man. Yep. That's that's and it's fine. It's good. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this is seat. I do like sitting down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it, it's. I mean, it's it's cool. And you know, you know. And if it doesn't mean that I'll never do anything else in comic books again, but mm -hmm. I don't. I'll be drawing a comic book anymore because that's a young person's game. Yeah. Um, it's uh yeah. It's an interesting thing, but it's uh yeah, man. Like we 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 have we we live different lives throughout our, our one life. So mm -hmm. exactly. We, we we you should yeah. embrace all of the different phases and enjoy them all equally. Yeah. And know when it's time to pass the pen and you know yeah. start That's enjoying true. other you know start enjoying other people's works and just you know yeah. be content with that. And I think that's you know yeah 
So where can people find you? Just, so, I mean, I've, I've said the Twitter, but um, yeah, uh, you do. I mean, I, on Twitter, I mean, Twitter has been good for me career wise, which is why the most recent fiasco has been such a sad thing, but you know, well, hopefully yeah. it'll still come forward. You know, I have my website, zachdavison.com that I barely ever update. And now nice. like a lot of people are like, well, maybe I should start updating that more. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but mainly Twitter. Twitter is the best place to look for me so far. And hopefully I don't cede too much turf to Elon Musk. That's part of like, I feel like like it was yeah. ours before it was his and we need to fight him a little bit for it rather than just jump ship. So person. I don't know. Well, if you're interested in learning the lore and, and all the ins and outs of the superhero glass uh, novelty glasses yeah. from Arby's and Burger King, et cetera, and so forth from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> Find our thread on yeah. uh, on Twitter and enjoy because there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, yeah. Zach, it was really great. Great talking to you too, Alex. Yeah, so yeah. much fun. Um, and uh, all the info to, cannot, to find you will be in the doobly-doo. So uh, find cool. Zach, check out what he's doing, go find Demon Days, do all the things. And um, yeah. Yeah. Until all right. Week. Yeah. It was and a until then, I'll see what you're drinking next, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. See you. Talk to you.